Chaos loves a vacuum. This podcast is a conscious effort to fight the impending darkness by filling that void with light. These episodes will explore myth, ancient texts, scripture, great works of world literature, and the voices of artists past and present to find the traces, threads, and imprints of the light they left behind. Welcome to Reflecting Light. And now, here's your host, Mandy Green. Welcome to Reflecting Light. It's a beautiful Christmas season, and I am stoked about our content for the entire month. We'll be visiting different narratives about Christmas and lots of different points of view that hopefully you're not as familiar with. So if there's ever a month to listen, this would be the month. I hope you're all doing well, staying safe and healthy. Um, The gift you could give the podcast would be to share it. If you love it, give us a five-star rating and give us a nice review because that puts us out into the general public. And then if you have friends who you think would really benefit from some of the things that we explore, feel free to share it that way. This will be part one of at least three episodes. I've entitled this month, A Very Merry Christmas. And Mary is spelled M-A-R-Y because I particularly would like to emphasize the role of Mary, the mother of God. Eastern Orthodox tradition She is called Theotokos, which is God-bearer, or the one who gives birth to God. And so this is part one we'll do today about Theotokos, Mary, and then hopefully part two, we'll look at um, actual accounts of the actual birth event. And if we get through that, um, part three, we'll look at some other things to do with the Christmas story. Now, the purpose of this podcast isn't to restate what you are already familiar with. I know you all know this story really, really well. What I'd like to do, or I hope to do, is look at the outlines of the picture or look at the setting more closely. Look at the hidden meaning in the shadows of the words or the shadows of different symbols portrayed in the text we'll look at today to see if we can add some more dimension to this tale that really is the center of Christianity. Purpose today is to highlight the role and being of the Mother Mary. I'd like to start with a quote from Margaret Barker. Now, there's this wonderful book called uh, Christmas, the Original Story. Margaret Barker is a tremendous biblical scholar. She knows Hebrew and Greek and has written a lot of things about ancient temples and the mother of the Lord. So she's a great woman. I've actually met her. She's wonderful. She's one of the most down-to-earth women I've met, and she's brilliant, and she loves the Lord. So great source for all of this. All right. So her quote is, the great festivals of the church have been almost taken over by supermarkets and sporting events. Easter is a time for bonnets and bunnies and chocolate eggs. Christmas, which starts at the end of October, is for reindeer and mistletoe and mince pies. If nativity plays have come a long way since St. Francis first set up his crib. Either they are banned to satisfy the politically correct, or they are modern and have the birth in a bus shelter. Or they are sentimental and have squirrels and even sea creatures at the crib. The original story is so much better. It has suffered from overfamiliarity, and the words are sometimes lost in a flurry of domestic distraction. Reread and repondered the original story of the incarnation is one of the greatest treasures in the Bible. Beautiful words. So today, to add to what you already know or are familiar with, I'm going to put some information out there. But test it. Try it. Let these images... Let these words sink into your soul and see what happens. A lot of things that have eternal weight require some spiritual digestion and they have to be able to sink and to shift and to sit inside of you. We're all familiar with the biblical text. So what I'm trying to do is give you 
added text. And the other really important piece is the context. Today we're going to look at a text called the Proto-Evangelium of James. Proto meaning first, Evangelium, the good news, right? The good news of the gospel. So this is the first good news or the pre-good news or the very beginning of the good news. And this is a different story than most, most Western traditions are familiar with. It's very familiar to someone from an Eastern Orthodox tradition. And so what I want to do first is give you some background before we jump into the text. The time and place that it's set in has everything to do with the ancient temple. The Temple of Solomon is our first prototype. If you're looking at a Judeo-Christian prototype, there's the three different stages, right? You've got the outer court where you have the altar and the basin of water, right? But in the first temple period, the menorah was actually in the Holy of Holies, not in the holy place. And that's going to be part of our story. The Holy of the Holy Place, which is the in between the Holy of Holies and the outer court is sometimes also referred to as a garden. And if you look at the creation story, Adam and Eve are in the presence of God, and then they're in the garden, and then they're thrown out of the garden. And so you could also superimpose those three stages onto the three areas of the temple. And the angel's instructions are for them to stop going westward, to turn around, face the east, and re-enter into the garden, and eventually back into the presence of God in the Holy of Holies. The setting of the story actually has so much to do with the ancient temple. You can't remove the story from out of that type of a setting. The second part that's going to be really, really important, and this is really the focus of the podcast today, is Mary as the Theotokos, the God-bearer. Is, is often what she's called in the Eastern tradition. And much of the beginning stages of the Proto-Evangelium of James has everything to do with her background. Where did Mary come from? Who were her parents? Why was she holy? How was she chosen of God? Where was she when the angel visited her? All of these different things. That's going to be another really, really important piece. All right. Now, understand between... And I know I keep saying this, and I promise in January, the Deuteronomistic reforms or the reforms of Josiah, what separates the second temple period from the first temple period? That's going to be really, really important for many of the things we talk about. The Theotokos is going to be critical in this first first gospel of James. Now, we're talking about James, the brother of Jesus Christ. In Western tradition, it's always thought that Mary had children after she bore Jesus, right? There's the verse that Joseph didn't know his wife. To know in Hebrew would mean to know intimately, so it's inferred that she had sexual relations with Joseph. However, the Proto-Evangelium is going to really tip that whole theory on its head and give you another point of view. Again, just sit with it. See what it see what happens. But according to this text, James is the older stepbrother, you would say, of Jesus Christ. And when Christ is born, James is an eyewitness. He's a teenager and he goes to Bethlehem with them. He's 15 or 16. And this is his account of the birth or the advent of Jesus Christ. A tremendous symbol of the lady of heaven, the great lady of heaven, the one who is with God, the companion or consort of El, is the tree. The symbol of her is the tree. As I've thought about this all day, we're going to have to have, I'm going to offer a class on this because there's no way we can cover this in a podcast or several podcasts, but um, I'm going to create a class about this called Wisdom in the Ancient World. It will probably show up about mid-2021, 
But if you if you're interested in learning about wisdom in the ancient world, then wisdom is a key word for the divine feminine. Um, you can go to my website www.mandybrookgreen.com and go to signups and sign up there, and we'll send you the information when I get it all sorted out. The God Bearer, the one who gives birth, is referencing this divine feminine, this holy mother. Now, the holy tree, the tree of life, which is one of her symbols, was actually in the Holy of Holies during the first temple. That was so critical to understand her prominent place in ancient Hebrew religion, that she was right beside her husband, El, and that together they form and fashion the heavens. All right. Those symbols are going to be important in understanding this Proto-Evangelium. Now, the Proto-Evangelium, the earliest text we have is called the Papyrus Bodmer, number five, and it dates to about the third century CE. Please don't forget that before these written texts, there's a great oral tradition that's passed down. Most things were passed down orally. It's very Western of us to say, well, where's the text, right? Where's the proof? But remember that Jesus, we don't have any record of anything Jesus personally wrote down. His teachings were transmitted orally. And that's important to remember about the transmission of truth during this time and place. So the Papyrus Bodmer number five is someone who actually took it and wrote it down eventually. But early church fathers like Clement of Alexandria and Eusebius and Polycarp, they all talk about this oral tradition and learning things and, and hearing things and committing it to their heart rather than to paper. But Irenaeus, who died in 200 CE, in commenting about Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna, said, I remember how he spoke of knowing John and the others who had seen the Lord, how they repeated their words from memory. To these things I listened eagerly at the time, not committing them to writing, but learning them by heart. Really beautiful sentiment. And as you listen to this Proto-Evangelium of James, I want you to think of James as a teenager, eyewitness account of this tremendous event, somehow passing this on and someone eventually writes it down. All right. So let's jump in the infancy gospel of James. I'm just going to read you small excerpts from it in the show notes on the website. So the website for this podcast is reflectinglight.org. On there, you can listen to any episode you can look at the show notes, which will reference any quote I use or anything like that. In the show notes for this particular episode, I'm going to put the link to a PDF of the Infancy Gospel of James, thanks to Arizona State University. So you can click on that link and download and print out and read this for yourself. It's not a long text. We won't have time to cover all of it. I'm just going to cover the first few chapters of it today and we'll continue. It's like a great, you know, like when you were a little kid and it was cookie and milk time and you got to sit down with your teacher as she read you a Christmas story. That's what we're going to do. We'll just do it in nice, digestible, beautiful bites. All right, the Infancy Gospel of James. It is written in the histories of the twelve tribes of Israel that there was a man named Joachim who was very rich. He offered his gifts to the temple. When the great day of the Lord approached and the people of Israel offered their gifts, Reuben stood opposite him and said, It is not lawful for you to offer your gifts first, for you have fathered no children in Israel. Joachim grieved. He went to the records of the twelve tribes to see if he was the only one who had fathered no children. When he searched, he found that all the righteous had fathered children. Joachim was distressed, avoided his wife's company, and went off into the desert where he pitched his tent and fasted for forty days and nights. 
he said to himself, I will not go down for food or drink until the Lord my God has visited me. Prayer shall be my food and drink. That's chapter one. You will find that Joachim is the father of Mary. And he's offering gifts at the temple and he's childless. Do you see any biblical parallels here? I hope you do. And the 40 days and 40 nights and fasting in the desert, going down into the desert, always a symbol for mortality. Chapter two, Anna, his wife, lamented and wailed for two reasons. She said, I am lamenting because I am a widow and because I have no child. And her maid comes up and says, you're terrible. You don't have any children. So she said to herself, what shall I do? I will pray with tears to the Lord my God to visit me. Then she changed out of her mourning clothes. You're going to see a lot of Isaiah in here. She changed out of her mourning clothes, put on her bridal garments and adorned her head. Definite temple imagery here, changing out of clothes, putting on wedding garments, adorning her head. At about the ninth hour, she went to walk in the garden. Remember what I said about the setting? Okay, there's a lot of temple imagery here. She saw a laurel tree, sat down under it and prayed to the Lord, O God of our fathers, bless me and hear my prayer. As you blessed the womb of Sarah and gave her a son, Isaac. That's the end of chapter two. So Joachim is out in the desert fasting and praying for 40 days. Anna changes out of her mourning clothes, her her sackcloth, puts on a bridal garment, adorns her head, goes to walk in the garden under a tree and prays. I hope you're seeing symbols pop out. Chapter 3 Looking up into heaven, she saw a nest of sparrows in the laurel tree. And she wept quietly, saying to herself, I am wretched. Whoever brought me into this world, what womb gave birth to me just to be cursed by the people of Israel and reproached and mocked so that I cannot go to the temple of the Lord? Who is as wretched as I am? I am not like the birds of the heaven, for even they have young before you, O Lord. So she gives this beautiful prayer about how she's looking about, and even in nature, she sees all of these patterns of birth and beginning and life continuing. Chapter four. See if this has any familiarity to you. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, Anna, Anna, the Lord has heard your prayer and you will conceive and have a child and your offspring shall be known throughout the world. Anna said, as the Lord my God lives, whether I have a male child or a female, I will offer it as a gift to the Lord my God and it shall serve him all of its life. Then two messengers came to her and said, your husband Joachim is coming home with the flocks. An angel of the Lord came down to him and said, Joachim, Joachim, the Lord has heard your prayer. Go down for Anna, your wife has conceived a child. Chapter five, the next day he took his offering saying to himself, if the Lord accepts me, the gold plate, there's a plate on top of the high priest turban that bears the name of the Lord, will show me. Now, it was popularly thought that when the plate shone, it was a symbol of God's favor. As Joachim offered his gifts, he looked at the high priest's gold plate as he went to the Lord's altar, and he saw that he was not a sinner. Now I know that the Lord has been gracious to me and forgiven my sins. He sees this flash of light on the plate of the high priest. Now, some people say that this is the priestly blessing or the ironic blessing that we find in Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. And this is my translation. Yahweh bless you and guard you. 
Now, bless you is in the imperfect sense, meaning it's not a completed action. It's an action that's repeated over and over. And PL means an exclamation point on the action being taken. God, whatever God does is done in an emphasized form and is put into a conjugation called PL, which means it's emphasized. It's an exclamation. It's an abundance of something. So Yahweh abundantly and repeatedly bless you and keep you or guard you. That word keep isn't like hold you, it's to like a keep, like a castle is a protection against you. Show his favor or grace or incline himself toward you and lift up his countenance upon you to give you peace or shalom. Shalom can also mean completeness. Now completeness is really, really important in ordinances Perfection, teleos in Greek, has everything to do with completeness, not perfection in our modern Western sense. So the priestly blessing is that the Lord will exponentially and continually bless you and guard you or keep you, show his favor or incline himself toward you. Do you see the temple imagery here? And lift up his face or his countenance upon you and give you peace and completeness. This really is piercing the veil into the presence of God. So that light shining has this beautiful connotation. He went home from the temple and after nine months, Anna had a baby and it was a girl. And Anna responds saying, My soul is magnified this day. Do you see any echoes of that in Mary, her daughter? I hope so. Chapter 6. The child grew stronger by the day, and when she was six months old, her mother put her on the ground to see if she could stand. Now remember, six is a number for almost complete, right? The world is created in six days. She puts Mary on the ground, and Mary walks seven steps There's a text that shows up the same time as the Proto-Evangelium of James called the Ascension of Isaiah. And according to the Ascension of Isaiah, and if you'd like more information about this, I reference it in the podcast I did with Mike Day in his podcast, Talking Scripture, about Mary Magdalene. You can go reference that. But in the Ascension of Isaiah, there's seven celestial heavens. So anything that's referencing seven, seven is a number for completeness and wholeness. And this idea of Mary taking seven steps is really significant. And then her mother picked her up and said, as the Lord, my God lives, you shall not walk on the ground again until I take you to the temple of the Lord. She's kept safe. She's guarded Her feet never touch the ground after that. After those seven steps, they hire uh, people to take care of her. And Mary would put her down to sleep in the holy place of her bedroom. Chapter 7. The months passed and the child was two years old. Joachim said, let us take her to the temple of the Lord and fulfill our promise. But Anna said, let us wait until she is three so that she does not miss her father and mother. Joachim agreed. When the child was three, Joachim said, Call for the pure Hebrew girls and let each of them take a lighted lamp so that the child does not turn around and be distracted away from the temple of the Lord. Do you see some some ten virgins imagery, right? Definitely bride imagery where the people go out with the lights to await the bridegroom. The priest received the child, kissed her, and blessed her, and said, The Lord has made your name great among all generations, and in the last days the Lord will reveal through you the redemption of his people Israel. He made her to sit on the third step of the altar. Pay attention to all of these little details. They're in there for a reason. And the Lord put grace on her. And she danced with her feet, and all the house of Israel loved her. 
Chapter 8 Her parents leave her at the temple. Mary was in the temple of the Lord, brought up like a dove and fed by an angel. When she was 12 years old, the priest conferred and said, Mary has grown to be 12 years old in the temple of the Lord. So she's been kept in the temple of the Lord for those nine years. What shall we do so that she does not pollute the temple of the Lord? Meaning when she begins to menstruate, blood is considered very impure and unclean. So they can't keep her in the temple when she begins menstruating. And so they ask the high priest, you stand at the altar of the Lord, go in and pray about her. Whatever the Lord reveals to you, we will do. So the high priest puts on the priestly vestment with the 12 bells. Now the bells were pomegranates that were sewn into the bottom hem of the priestly vestments and prayed about here. An angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Zacharias, Zacharias, go out and call together all the widowers and let each man bring a rod with him. The Lord will give a sign to the one who is to have her as his wife. We'll talk about this when we look at the Gospel of Luke, but the Greek word there used is to have watch over or to be a guardian over. It's not necessarily a husband and wife thing. Like you're going to see in this text, and I would actually translate that way in Luke 2 as well, and you'll see why. Chapter 9, all of the high priests assemble with their rods and go to the temple, and the high priest prays a prayer. And he goes out to all of these widowers. There's no sign. So he gives all of the rods back to the men. And Joseph is the very last man to receive his rod. And I'll read what this says. Joseph received his rod last and a dove came from it and flew onto Joseph's head. Again, the sign of the dove. The priest said to Joseph, you have been chosen to take the Lord's virgin and keep her for yourself. Joseph refused, saying, I have sons, and I am an old man. She is only a girl, and the people of Israel will laugh at me. The priest said to Joseph, Fear the Lord your God, and remember what God did. Joseph said to Mary, I have received you from the temple of the Lord. I will leave you in my house while I go away to work on my buildings, and then I will come back. The Lord will watch over you. So Joseph takes Mary into his home, but then he leaves, and she's left there. Chapter 10, the priests hold a council and they decide that they need to weave a new veil for the temple. Now remember that Herod is totally remodeling the temple during this time. And so it wouldn't be crazy that they're going to reweave the veil. Now, for a, for a little bit of background, as you can see, this thing is so rich with symbols, but I'm trying to just begin to pull one small piece of a thread out for you and you continue to pull the threads as you see fit. But in Job, it talks about the heavenly wife weaving the cosmos. When they talk about women weaving the veil of the temple, I want you to think of it in lots of different ways. Not so much so literally, but in, in the sense of the divine mother weaving the cosmos. And in the sense of a mortal mother weaving the body of the child that they bear. So they go to reweave the veil of the temple and they summon all the pure virgins of the tribe of David. And they searched around and found seven virgins. Again, there's our number seven. But then they remembered that Mary was of the tribe of David and also pure before God. So she's also brought in. And so that gives you eight now, if seven is the number of completeness, eight is the number of just absolute superlative godlikeness. According to the ascension of Isaiah, God is in the eighth level. I don't think it's chance that Mary is the eighth virgin in that text. They get these virgins to begin to weave. The lots for the true purple and the scarlet fell to Mary and she took them home. It was at this time that Zacharias became dumb and Samuel took his place until he could speak. 
Mary took the scarlet and began to spin. Now recall that in the ancient veil of the temple, that the veil was made up of four colors to represent the four elements. So scarlet, purple, blue, and linen to represent the four elements that make up the earth. Mary took the scarlet and began to spin. Scarlet can also be seen as a symbol of blood. And when we get to the shepherds in our nativity story, a lamb that was the firstborn, the one that opened up the womb and was without blemish, was tagged as a temple sacrifice. And the way they tagged them was they would tie a red string around the foot of the lamb and they would wrap the feet so that that lamb's feet never touched the ground. Do you see how these beautiful symbols keep showing up? All right, chapter 11, she took her pitcher and went to fill it with water. There was a voice saying, now, she took her pitcher and went to fill it with water. This is a woman at the well. If you know the story of Isaac and Rebecca, everything that story has to do with a woman's duties, a woman's place, what water, water is a very feminine symbol. So here she is at the well, at the cistern. There was a voice saying, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. This is an extraordinary greeting by an angel. If you look at all the other references of angels visiting people, The first words are, fear not. I want to point out that this greeting is different than any other greeting you're going to see. This is how the angel addresses her. Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And she gets scared and she she goes home and puts the pitcher away. And then she took up the purple and sat down on her seat and drew out the thread. And I'll just read from the text. Then she took up the purple, sat down at her seat and drew out the thread. Then an angel of the Lord stood before her saying, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found grace before the Lord of all things. And thou shalt conceive of his word. When she heard this, she questioned with herself and then said, Shall I conceive from the living God and bring forth in the same way as all women? What an insightful question. The angel said, No, Mary, for a power of the Lord shall overshadow you. And so the Holy One to be born from you shall be called the Son of the Highest. You will give him the name of Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Mary said, Behold, the servant of the Lord is before him. Let it happen as you have said. So this incarnation of Emmanuel, which means God is with us, is going to take place in a way different from the way it happens with mortals usually. Chapter 12, she worked the purple and scarlet. She's weaving the veil while she's pregnant. Are you seeing this? And brought them to the priest who blessed her. And said, Mary, the Lord God has made your name great, and you will be blessed among all the generations of the earth. Mary rejoices. She goes to Elizabeth. When Elizabeth sees Mary, she says, How has this happened to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? The child within me leaped and blessed you. She stayed three months with Elizabeth, and day by day her womb swelled. Mary was afraid and went home and hid herself from the people of Israel. She was 16 when these mysteries happened to her. Mystery is a very big key word, isn't it? Chapter 13. When she was six months pregnant, Joseph came home from his building work, went into the house and saw that she was pregnant. He beat his face and threw himself on the ground on sackcloth and wept bitterly saying, how can I turn to the Lord my God? What shall I pray for, for this young woman? I received her as a virgin from the temple of the Lord my God. 
and I have not kept her safe. Who has trapped me like this? Who has done this wicked thing in my house and made the virgin unclean? Is not this the story of Adam repeating himself? And he addresses Mary and he says, How have you done this? How have you forgotten the Lord? And Mary wept bitterly and said, I am pure. I have not been with a man. And Joseph said, So how have you become pregnant? She said, I do not know how this happened to me. I think meaning it didn't happen to me in the normal way. Chapter 14, Joseph is terrified because he got this beautiful virgin from the temple of the Lord. She's in his home. No one's been there. And he comes home and she's she's pregnant. And so he thinks, I will just hide it because I can't face the elders because they know they gave her to me. So I'm just going to hide her and do it quietly and quickly. The night fell and an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Do not worry about this young woman, for the child within her is from the Holy Spirit. She will have a son whom you must name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Joseph rose from his sleep and glorified the God of Israel who had so favored her. Then Joseph watched over her. Beautiful words. You know, I think sometimes we think of dreams as insignificant or not having weight, but oftentimes that's a tremendous vehicle of communication for the divine. Chapter 15, Annas the scribe then came to him and said, why didn't you appear at the assembly? And he's talking to Joseph and he sees that Mary is pregnant. So he runs to the priest and said, Joseph's committed this great sin. Mary is pregnant. And of course, the priest is just horribly offended or terrified. And he sends officers to the home and they find that she's pregnant. So they bring Mary and Joseph to the priest for judgment. And he asks her, why have you done this? Let me read this text. The priest said, Mary, why have you done this? Why have you fallen so low and forgotten the Lord your God? You who were raised in the Holy of Holies. Do you see where she was raised? And fed by the hand of an angel. You who heard the hymns and danced. Why have you done this? Mary wept bitterly, saying, As the Lord my God lives, I am pure and have not been with a man. Notice her language. I have not been with a man. But what is in her is from God. Then the priest said to Joseph, Why have you done this? Joseph said, As the Lord my God lives, I am innocent in this matter. And they think he's been deceived. So chapter 16, the priest said, bring back the virgin who you received. And he gives them this test that they would often give to people who they felt had fornicated or committed adultery. And they would usually have the woman drink the bitter water if they were made sick by the bitter water and then they were guilty of the sin. And if they weren't, then they weren't guilty of the sin. So the priest said, I will give you the water of the Lord's judgment to drink, and that will reveal your sin. The priest took some of it, made Joseph drink it, and then sent him away into the hill country. He returned, and the water had not affected him. He also made Mary drink the bitter water and sent her into the hill country. She too returned with no sign of the curse. Now this is really, really unusual to have both parties take of the bitter water. But you could see how serious this was. All of the people were amazed because there was no sign that they had sinned. The priest then said, if the Lord God has not revealed your sin, I do not condemn you. He let them go. Joseph took Mary and went to his house rejoicing, glorifying the God of Israel. Well, we'll pick up next week when a decree goes out from Caesar Augustus. We will continue in the Proto-Evangelium of James. I just want you to let this sink in. I realize so much of it's new. 
please go to the show notes and download a copy of this. I also really recommend this book, Christmas, the Original Story by Margaret Barker. I'll also have a link to that. Let that sit with you. I want you this week to just think about the Theotokos. Who really is Mary? Where does she come from? Where is she raised? How is she really weaving the veil of the body of her son? He's incarnating in a mortal body. She's the one who sees him through this process. And as you'll see, the conception and the birth are not going to follow, according to this text, the typical way of the mortal, but that things are done in order to make it seem as though it's typical in order to hide him from the eyes of the adversary. I'd like to finish with a quote by Rilke, actually two quotes. The work of the eyes is done. Go now and do the heart work on the images imprisoned within you. If you would, please spend the next week doing the heart work on the images imprisoned within you that came up from this, this text I've shared. And the last uh, quote by Rilke is, the purpose of life is to be defeated by greater and greater things. I would probably, I'm going to transpose that just a little and say, the purpose of life, well, as we read in the scriptures, the book of John, is to know God, the only true God or Elohim. The purpose of knowledge is to be defeated by greater and greater truths. As you grow in light and truth, sometimes those previous truths will crumble just a little bit or give way to greater, heavier, more magnificent truths. My dear friends, may the spirit and light of Christ be in your homes and in your hearts. And may this heart work of these beautiful images of the Theotokos be part of your week. Love and Christmas lights. Thank you for joining us. We hope this episode lit a spark inside of you. For show notes and other information, please visit our website at reflectinglight.org. If you feel this program illuminated your mind and heart, consider a contribution to fund further episodes. And thanks for listening.